I'm going to be talking about the idea of race. When I think about similarity and difference, that's the thing that comes to mind for me. Uh, and the title of this talk is Race, Reality, and Illusion. Because as I'm going to discuss, race is and is not. Race is factual and race is fictional. And all of these paradoxes exist at the same time. Uh, as a historian, I find paradoxes really, really interesting. Uh, and race, uh, in my opinion, is one of easily the most paradoxical and something that's fundamental to human society all the way back to the ancient world. So before I get started, though, I'm going to have you look at these three gentlemen, Dr. Watson, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Venter. What I want you to do is, I want you to just take a couple of moments, look at them, notice their features, notice their traits, Notice any similarities that you might see, along with any differences. We'll revisit that. So my point in this is that race is, in fact, real. But it's not real in the way that you think it is. So Porter students, You've all been trained to think, to hear the idea of race is real, you're going to push back on that. Awesome. I'm going to push back as well. There are lots of ways that race is real. The idea that race is totally made up, you can't go lots of places in the United States and assert that to certain groups of people. If you're an African American in the United States, there was an analysis of 20 million different traffic stops you are twice as likely to get pulled over, and you are four times as likely to get your car searched. Race is real. If you're an African American in Florida, and you're convicted of a drug-related crime, you are going to get, on average, a longer sentence by 66% than a white person convicted of more or less the same crime. You crunch those numbers a little bit for you. I mean, this is what an historian looks like when he crunches numbers. I multiply it by three. Um, if a white convict is given a year, that means a year and eight months. White convict for an African American. White convict is given three years, that means an African American will serve on average five years. Based only on what they are perceived as, not based on the nature of their crime, rather based on what their perceived nature as a person. Before Washington State banned the death penalty, or Supreme Court banned it, you were 4.5 times more likely to receive the death penalty as an African American convicted of murder than you were if you were white. What that means is, for every two white people on death row in Washington State for murder, there were nine African Americans. In 2015, African Americans and Hispanics made up 32% of the U.S. population and 56% of the prison population. Don't tell those people that racism is real. Those people in Washington State get the difference between life and death. But there are people in this country who think that race goes beyond social construct, goes into biology. So, for example, in 2007, 60% of Mississippi Republicans said that either interracial marriage should be illegal or they're not sure whether it should be illegal. 60% of them. So, in 2007, it's a long time ago. We've come a long way since, no, no one, and no one's going to say we've come a long way since 2007, unfortunately, but let's just say we could say that. Um, you say, oh, Mississippi, that's, that's the deep south, and there's a lot of really ingrained racism going on there. Across the country in 2018, you go did a poll and found nearly 18% of Americans found mixed-race marriage to be morally wrong. Mixed-race marriage. This is an issue that we should be past. We should be so far past it, no one should be talking about it anymore. To those people, race is real. Race is biology. There's also white supremacy groups. There are currently more hate groups in the United States right now than there have been for decades. More than a thousand being tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center. That number grew from just over 900 two years ago. It's a 10% increase in two years. This is a quote from Andrew Anglin, who's the uh, editor of the Daily Stormer, the most visited quote-unquote news source among neo-Nazis. 
Located where? Right here in Connecticut. He said, we're different, referring to whites. We want absolute collective solidarity among our race. Don't tell Andrew Anglin, race isn't real. This gentleman, Richard Spencer, white nationalist, in my opinion, a neo-Nazi, also the head of National Policy Institute, he said, he's direct about it. Race is genetically coherent. It's got to do with genes. It's got to do with DNA. But it's not just that. It's got to do with people, and it's got to do with spirit. To people like Spencer, race is blood and race is culture. Race is real to him. Race is biologically, scientifically real, like gravity. How do people from the fringe, like Spencer and Anglin, or the people who think that interracial marriage is, quote, morally wrong, how do they arrive at this idea of race? I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical construct of race. Three more people. Carl Linnaeus, Johann Blumenbach, Josiah Nott. Linnaeus was a scientist, a naturalist in the Enlightenment. One thing the Enlightenment loved doing was taking things, labeling them, categorizing them. Before the Enlightenment, there were butterflies. <laughs> Once the Enlightenment arrives, here's a, you got a butterfly and another butterfly, and this butterfly's wings look slightly different than another butterfly. Linnaeus is the guy who developed our taxonomy. He's the guy who came up with genus, species, all of that. The problem is, once you start labeling animals, you start labeling people, too. He came up with four races. African, Asian, European, American, indigenous. Johann Blumenbach, considered by most people to be the father of anthropology. He had another race, Malay, meaning the people in the South Pacific. Fifty years later, Josiah Knott, who's a doctor, a surgeon, also a slave owner, he's added the Inuit, Eskimo, Arctic, which is to say Arctic indigenous. He split African into two races, what he called Black African and Hottentot, referring to the indigenous Africans of South Africa, and then lastly, Australia. Eight races <coughs> over the course of a hundred years. We have no races, now we have eight. Okay, eight races. By the time he dies in 1873, we're already seeing the rise of racial anti-Semitism. People are beginning to question whether or not Jewish people actually are white. Uh, a guy named um, uh, Count de Gobineau argued in his book, The Inequality on the Inequality of Human Races, uh, that uh, he met a uh, Jewish person in Poland and said he was struck by how much they looked like the hieroglyphics that the Egyptians painted of the slaves building the pyramids. He argued basically that Jewish people have not phenotypically changed regardless of where they lived. They're in our race. So are we at nine now? Okay. Russo-Japanese War, 1905-1906. Japanese soundly defeat the Russians. Some people say, ooh, wait a second, okay, so maybe the Japanese aren't actually Asian the same way that the Chinese are. There's something else. And then other people say, or maybe it's because the Russians aren't white, but rather that they're blended with the Asians, so maybe the Russians are a branch of the Asian race, and the Japanese, the Japanese might be white, Russians might be Asian. What's going on? Yeah, agree. This is an absolute mess, and there's a totally logical way to explain that. It's all made up. This is just people looking at other people and trying to categorize them. But this is accepted as science for a long, long time. There are universities in the United States that actually had um, racial studies departments. Not American studies departments, racial studies departments. Things like eugenics. These have very, very real repercussions for Americans. North Carolina, for example, they had eugenics laws in the books until the 70s. The 1970s. What I'm going to talk about now, I wanted to actually make sure that the citation ended up, comes from an article uh, based on uh, genome sequencing. So let's move into now. And here we are again. 
Dr. Watson, Dr. Kim, Dr. Venn. Dr. Watson, you may have heard of him. He's considered one of the fathers, uh, one of the fathers of DNA. He won the Nobel Prize along with another uh, his uh, uh, partner, uh, Dr. Crick, uh, for figuring out the DNA was a double helix. Uh, it was also based on research for, by a woman um, named Franklin who got zero uh, credit, but that's another TED talk. Um, Dr. Kim is a leading cancer researcher in um, the Republic of Korea. He was also the first person in Korea to have their entire genome mapped uh, and then opened, the, opened that genome up to the academy. Dr. Ventner is a uh, geneticist, a uh, genomics researcher, and he's so good at his job, actually, he doesn't work at a university. He works at his own genetic research center, started his own center. That's how good he is. All three of these men have their genomes mapped. Their entire genetic sequence is mapped. And so, the authors of his paper said, whoa, you know what would be cool? Let's compare them. And this is where we get into the science of what we're going to talk about. And I'm really going to out myself as somebody who struggles with science. Um, the issue of alleles. So my wife, who's a microbiologist, uh, I, I was making this up. I said, uh, Sarah, could you explain what alleles are to me? And then she did. I said, could you dumb it down, please? <laughs> And then she did. And then three passes later, she finally said, oh my god, okay, so they're, they're like kinds of genes. So your hair is a kind of gene, and, or it is, is a gene, and, and then your hair color is like the allele. And I was like, whoa, okay, wait, 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 wait. So it, they're like items on a menu? And she said, I, I, I guess? And so, okay, wait, wait, so instead of, this would be like soup. And then these would be like, uh, I don't know, tomato and um, clam chowder. And so here are your genes, the pink ones, eye color, hair color, hair texture, freckles. And these are your alleles. We've all got the genes, we just have different alleles. Great. And thanks again to my wife for being as patient as she's been for the past 10 years, especially that one evening. <laughs> So now we're going to go back to these three gentlemen. They compared the genome of all three. Check out what they found. This is Dr. Kim, Dr. Watson, Dr. Venter. This is the points at which they overlap. Now, I made this Venn diagram, looked at it, and said, this is, I, I don't even know what this means. <laughs> so I went back through and I filled in some things. Dr. Watson and Dr. Kim share two alleles. Dr. Ventner and Dr. Kim share two alleles. All three of them share one, and Dr. Venter and Dr. Watson share one. What does all that mean? What that means is Dr. Watson, who's a Brit, and Dr. Venter, who's a European of uh, American of European heritage have less in common than each of them do with Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim is more genetically similar to each of them than they are to one another. Now, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to you know, sort of say what you were thinking, but I bet some of you found that surprising. All of these differences that we see up here the phenotypical differences, the appearances, they're obvious and they're apparent. And they fool us. They fool us into thinking that those are the essential differences. When in fact, number one, all humans are about 99.9% .9 genetically identical, more or less. But give that some, some sense of it. You're given a test with 100 questions, and the last question has 10 parts. All of us have the exact same answers except for the last one, the last subpart within that last question. But along with that, once you scratch past the surface, these phenotypical differences, they lie. They don't matter. They're the thing that fools us into focusing on our differences and in convincing us that somehow or another, I mean, show of hands, how many of you thought that these two were actually similar? 
I mean, yeah, this is cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. You used your eyes. But that's the problem. Is that race rests on these phenotypical differences, which are totally surface differences. And in fact, these totally surface differences can hide the truth of our similarity. Beyond the whole human similarity, the fact that if you look to your left and you look to your right, you might see people who look different than you. But you might actually be more similar to them than the people who look similar to you. No problem, you might think. This is old hat man, that Richard Spencer guy, the angling guy, those folks down in Mississippi. They're totally out of the realm of reality, right? Those people are the people who think these crazy things, and all of us are enlightened, and all of us understand this way better than they do. I'm going to play a little game. Guess who said it? I, I am inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa. All our social policies are based on the fact that our intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all the testing says, not really. Nobel laureate, Dr. James Watson. In your interview conducted just a few years ago. This is one of the most important scientists of the 20th century. Undeniably brilliant. Undeniably brilliant. And yet still, he is unable, despite his knowledge of humanity, on, on a genetic level, he's unable to get past these old ideas. So how do we do this? How do we get past these ideas? I've been giving that a lot of thought. So in terms of how we adapt and, 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 and try and make a society that is, racially speaking, more just. There are ways to address the criminal justice system. There's an organization, for example, called uh, Hashtag um, Cut50, uh, which is aiming at essentially reducing the US prison population, uh, which in 2015 made up um, um, more than 5% of the entire prison population in the world, um, by 50%. There are uh, other organizations, like the Sentencing Project, um, uh, which take local organizations and sort of pull them to try and then work with government to get rid of things like mandatory minimums, uh, to try and create a, a more just and equitable justice system. But along with that, on an individual level, we need to get past these surface differences and remind ourselves that all of this dissonance, all of this noise, all of this difference has been a product of science that was simply wrong, and sometimes just hate. And so, as individuals, as we move forward in our daily choices, when we interact with one another, we have that option to remind ourselves that what we perceive as difference, as reality, is in fact really just illusion. I'll close with a quote from Haile Selassie, the former leader of Ethiopia in front of the United Nations, who's wistful of a time wherein he hoped that the color of a man's skin would have no more significance than the color of his eyes. Those are just alleles, man. And that option is ultimately up to us. Thank you.